Okay, so we're coming back after the Passover holiday, continuing the series about Jewish mysticism. Tonight's topic is going to surprise many. It deals with a very esoteric subject called witchcraft and its cohorts, the evil spirits. We've been speaking about spirituality a bit, and we've learned that there is something called the fifth dimension, spirituality. In this particular dimension, there are also energies, all kinds of forces that we may not be able to see, but we can experience. We can feel them. And in Judaism, you find a lot of mention about this. Judaism is very well acquainted with all these forces, all these powers, and they are mentioned in the Torah. Stay away from them, be careful with them. In other words, it does not deny them. On the contrary, it admits they exist and it warns us about their effects. Therefore, how important it is to maintain our distance from them. In Judaism, you actually find that the rabbis discuss all kinds of ways of dealing with them. But first and foremost, it's important to identify if this is a good force or a negative force. In other words, Judaism always agrees that there are many, many powers out there, forces, <coughs> energies. We have no problem admitting that. But the question is, and the real big question has always been, where is this power? Where is this force coming from? Is it from the pure force? Is it from the impure camp? Where, what is the source of this force? In other words, forces exist. All kinds of powers exist. Our, our question was always, not if it exists or not, it's very possibly real. But where is it coming from? And because there's always a question where something is coming from, Maimonides writes in the, in the very beginning of his book, Yad HaZaka, that don't think for a moment that the Jewish people accepted Moses because of his demonstrating the facts that these are from God through the ototum of Tim, through the many miracles that he performed. The Jewish people did not rely on those miracles, did not accept Moses' word for it. Why? Because perhaps he did all of that with witchcraft. It is only because of revelation. It is only because of what they experienced, of what they witnessed, and what they heard from Hashem directly. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Had they not heard it from him, had they not witnessed it, had not all of them been there at the time, who is to say that this is true? Maybe he's making it up. Maybe it's just another cult, another religion. We need proof. They all witnessed it there. So therefore, this could not have been a magic trick. And it's definitely not his charisma. And the book he wrote, well, he even criticizes himself. So. There's enough evidence from the Torah itself, from the experience that the Jewish people had, that this was not some form of witchcraft, something coming from the impure forces. It's important to keep in mind when we cover this topic what the difference is between the two of them, between the good forces and the evil forces. That which is good that which is pure leads man to his ultimate purpose and mission in life. It guides him properly. He is able to accomplish that which he is created for. The impure forces, the negative powers, don't lead you in the right direction. They are against God. Why were they created? Just to enable free will. That's all. Another way of looking at it is we would not appreciate the importance or the beauty of light without darkness. Now that we have darkness, we can also appreciate what is different, the opposite of darkness, light. These two opposite forces are not just very, very different. They compete. They want the human being to be their client. Be my customer. So there's continuous competition between 
the forces of purity and the forces of impurity. Continuous competition. And why is it so difficult? Well, the forces of impurity assure us that you can enjoy life. You can have all the pleasures. As the rabbis tell us, the evil inclination pays cash, whereas God only promises post-dated check in the world to come, in paradise, in Gan Eden. So when you see something tangible, something physical, it's attractive, it's tempting, yes, it's very, very powerful indeed. So there's a continuous competition. But the Torah warns us, be careful not to be misled by them. Because if you are misled and you are trapped by them, you're going to have a very hard time getting away from them. It becomes very addictive, it becomes comfortable, it becomes a habit, and you don't want to move away from it. Problem is that as a result of having the two very, very different forces around all the time, there is a lack of clarity, there's a lot of confusion. What is the truth? What are we expected to do? What should we embrace? You know, today there's many, many cults, many religions, many beliefs. It's confusing. As a result of all these forces out there, it can be confusing. And when that happens, that which is true is concealed. And the Kabbalah teaches that Hashem intentionally created the world in such a way that He should be partially concealed. As one rabbi once said, God plays hide and seek. He wants us to find Him, to discover Him. For some reason, that's the way He created the world. When we talk about the evil forces, the evil spirits, we are talking about or we are including the following. Demons, witchcraft, seances, curses, the evil eye, the satan, all of that belongs to the same camp, the impure camp. It is not possible for us in one hour to delve into each one of these areas in detail. And some of them I've already covered. And there are lectures about the impure forces, there are lectures about UFOs, there are lectures about demons, there are lectures about seances, and there's a lecture about the evil eye as well. So whoever wants more information about those particular areas, you can just go ahead and listen to the other lectures. What we want to do now is just to understand a little bit better how they operate, in general what they have in common, and what we can do about them. The common denominator of all of these impure forces is that they speak the same language. Do you know which language that is? Which? Sheker, falsehood. It's totally false. What they preach is completely false. Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, the prophet, in rebuking the Jewish nation, says to them, why are you pursuing this borot nishbarim? He calls these forces these attractions, empty pits, broken pits. You know, was a pit, a container that cannot hold anything. Why can't it hold anything? Because what they promise, they can't deliver. It is not real. This concept that Yirmiyahu uses, borot nishbarim, broken or empty vessels, reminds me of the Kabbalistic concept, kelim shvurim. Shvirat HaKelim is a concept in Kabbalah where the vessels in the creation, certain vessels that God created, were broken because of the immense light, the Or of Hashem, the Or and Sof, penetrated everything that was around. And these vessels, that which is a little bit more physical, could not contain all that light from Hashem, and they broke. To simplify, this idea of broken vessels, let's just say that these broken vessels represent the impure forces. They are broken, which means they cannot contain the light, which means they are opposed to the light. They don't want this light. They don't
don't want anything which is good, anything that serves the ultimate purpose. They're against it. If you want to have an idea of a personification of this in real life, Amalek. The Amalekites represent that which is the epitome of evil, or that which is against divinity or faith in God. So, these broken vessels do contain sparks of holiness, the Kabbalah says, because without some spark of holiness, they cannot exist at all. Anything that is in existence contains a little bit of holiness. But, for the most part, they're broken. As the rabbis tell us, Asheker en lo raglain. Falsehood has no feet. It cannot last forever. It could easily be undone. We can make it disappear, not forever, but it's not permanent. Therefore, whoever lives in that world is living in olam medume, in a world of imagination, not in the real world. It's not real. It's not permanent. It's fantasy. It's not reality. The big question, however, is, I think this is one of the most important questions when we talk about witchcraft and all these evil spirits. Why are some people so interested in this. They, are act, they actually gravitate to this for some reason much more than to holiness. What makes this so tempting? So for those of you who've learned the Torah, you know that to become unclean, to become tameh, it is sufficient to just touch an object which is impure. It's very easy to become impure, unclean. To be holy requires tremendous amount of work an effort. So to be holy is a lot more difficult than to be unclean. It's just easier to be unclean, to do that which is wrong. I thought of a good example for explaining this a little bit better. Imagine a child who grew up in China. And he's three years old, four years old, five years old. He's already able to talk. Does he know how to speak Chinese? Most likely, he picked it up, it was easy, that is where he grew up. He had no trouble, it wasn't a challenge. Once he's able to talk, children are able to grasp a language very quickly. In linguistics, they say up to the age of 10, pretty much all languages are alike. A child is receptive, he hears, he learns quickly. Take the same child. And during his teenage years, try to teach him another language, especially one that is very different than what he's used to. It won't be so easy, not anymore. It's not his native tongue. He needs to sit down, learn a new vocabulary, new grammar, sentence structure. It's not easy. And some languages then become much more difficult and complex than others. The same thing with this world. This world, Rabbi say, is called Olama Sheker. It's the world of falsehood. That's the language they speak here. Truth is concealed. That which is pleasurable stands out. That which is physical is tangible. It stands out and it's very accessible. So this is the native tongue of the human being. As I explained another week, this is the home team for the body. It feels at home. It is a native. It therefore grabs what comes to him with ease. What he sees is enjoyable, what he senses. You start telling him about a spiritual world, about holiness. What for? Who needs it? Who's to say that that is good for me? It's a challenge. So you can see that automatically the human being will easily gravitate towards the physical much more than to, towards the spiritual. Another explanation is as follows. The verse says, Olam chesed yibane. The world is built with kindness. You want to build this world? It's not just about skyscrapers. It's not just about subways. Yes, that is important for us to have a normal, decent life 
we want to have the ease with which to communicate and to travel and to live. But that's not really called building the world. The human being is not only about physical. He's not, he's not only physical. The human being has something spiritual about it. To build up the world, we need to build him up. To build him up, you do that with kindness. You transform him. You elevate him. And that has to be done with spirituality, kindness, giving. The impure forces are not interested in that. The impure forces are destructive. They're not interested in building. Just think about all the wars that we've had throughout history. Why so much war? Why so much murder, stealing, mm -hmm. corruption? What's all that? That's the Sitra Ahara, as it's called in Aramaic, the other camp. It's a destructive power. It's not a, a power that wants to build. It's, there's nothing divine in there. It's all about this world, this physical world. It wants to destroy that which is spiritual. And there's a saying in Russian, Lomat Nestroid. It is easier to destroy something than to build. So this power of destruction, therefore, is something that is easier for a person to identify with, for a human being to deal with. It comes easy to him. It's normal to build, to overpower my nature, to be a kinder individual, to build friendship, to make a marriage lasting. It requires, to, it requires of one to be forgiving and flexible and kind and generous and sensitive. Oh, that's too hard. <laughs> but that's called building, whether it's building yourself or building a relationship, which ultimately is what this world should be about, building the spiritual world, not just the physical world. But that's hard. So not only, as we said before, is that which is physical more tangible, accessible, and tempting, it's also easier than to be a spiritual individual. Now you can understand what the rabbis meant in the Midrash. There's a famous Midrash that says that God offered the Torah to all the nations of the world back then. And they were pagan. And they were not interested. Now what does it mean that they were not interested? Did he actually go from door to door? Not necessarily. God basically saw that these nations would not be interested in spirituality. The Jewish people had a better chance of being more spiritual. What, is, what did they choose instead, the nations of the world back then? Idolatry. What's idolatry? Why did they choose idolatry? I mean, after all, idolatry is a form, a form of worship, isn't it? So I saw a beautiful explanation by Rabbi Tversky, who says as follows. Idolatry is essentially a system whereby a person creates his own gods and erects his own ethical moral system to conform to his desires. In other words, you start off with your own desires, and based on what those desires are, you create your own gods, your own morals and ethical system uh, of beliefs in order for it to conform with your lifestyle. So you start off basically wanting certain things for yourself, and then you figure out how to make religion compatible with that. Whereas in Judaism, it's just the, it's the other way around. We need to conform to the Torah. You have the reform and conservative movements that did the exact opposite. Let's rearrange everything. Let's modify everything so that it conforms to our new lifestyle in the 20 and 21st century. The Torah says you can't do that. The Torah says you can't change this. This is a blueprint forever. It says so clearly. So what did they do? They said, oh, well, God never made it up. God never said this. According to them, there is no God. It was a committee. Well, once you say it's a committee, then of course you can change whatever you want. That's how they do away with it. Otherwise, you can't just play around with this. If this is the blueprint, then you conform to it. No. Idolatry, paganism, basically says 
let's create a belief system, ethical moral system in God that will conform to our desires, to our interests. Now you understand why a lot of people choose evolution over creation? It's just easier to believe that there is no God to whom you're accountable. Right? It's easier to believe that this doesn't exist. It's just everything is just a freak accident. That many, many years ago there was a big bang and it all somehow came together by itself. And everybody evolved. Survival of the fittest. It's easier to believe that. Now, why do I say evolution? Why not something else? The answer is there is no, there is nothing else. It's either this or that. If you don't believe in evolution, you have to believe in God, in a creation. So those who don't want to believe in creation have no choice. They have to believe in this, because there's really nothing else. So, which one is easier? Obviously, evolution is just easier to believe in. Creation? But there is a God, they say that's too incredible to believe. And what you're saying that everything happened by itself is not incredible? <laughs> I think that's even more incredible. But what does the evil inclination do? It convinces the human being this one is more scientific than this. After all, that's spirituality? They didn't teach that in physics or in chemistry. I can't see it. Yeah, but you can experience it. You can look into it. Oh, no, I'm not interested. Oh, you're not interested. So why don't you say so? You're not, in not that it doesn't exist. You're not interested. No one who is an atheist has really investigated in depth spirituality. The reason is they're not interested. Why are they not interested? Because it's easier to be an atheist, a non-believer, than to believe in a God to whom you're accountable for. Very simple. That is why the rabbis teach us that witchcraft, keshafim, are called keshafim ki makhishim pamalya shel mala. What does witchcraft end up doing? It is amazing. It is an amazing power. No doubt about it. And it exists. And where I come from, from Brazil, I can tell you, it still exists in different forms. Various countries in the world where you can actually see the impure forces at work. In America, you don't see it, you don't come across it, people think that you're crazy, that this is just a fairy tale, that there were witches once upon a time. This is real. The Torah says it's real. Do we see it as much as in the past? Perhaps not. I don't think we, we, we encounter it as much as they did in the past. But this is a formidable power. And the rabbis tell us they're called Keshavim Ki Machishim Pamal Yashema, what they do is that they end up denying, through their existence, through their changing of laws of nature, they end up denying, or doing away, even though it's temporarily, with the system that God has put in place, that follows certain rules. But they change those rules through witchcraft. They transform things into whatever they want to transform it to. So they are, in a sense, denying the existence of God through their involvement through their interference with the laws of nature. Or that they are basically saying, you see, you don't need God. We can do this and we can do that for you. And a lot of people throughout the history have been misled by that. If you study Kabbalah, however, you will find that there is a very, very powerful force called Kabbalah Ma'asit. In other words, white magic, as it's, some people want to call it, that you can use Kabbalistic names in all kinds of ways to achieve incredible feats that are not possible through nature. There is even an account of how certain rabbis were able to create a human being without a soul, obviously, through Kabbalah Masi, through practical Kabbalah. This is dangerous. It is not really done too often. But there were qualified people in the past, qualified, I say, because you have to be qualified, who did know how to use the Kabbalah to do certain things when there was a great need for it to be done. 
like to get from one place to another very quickly. So, but this is coming from the Kedusha, this is coming from pure forces, not from the impure forces. So our next question is, how is it possible for a, a physical body to relate or to connect to the spiritual world? After all, we have a physical body. How, is it able to actually do something in the spiritual world? How? What buttons does it press? So if you recall, we talked about the nefesh. The human being, even though he's physical, does have a soul and does have something called a nefesh behemi, which is a little bit more physical, an animalistic spirit, which is very, very close to his physical body. And this nefesh behemi, this physical spirit, acts in a sense as a bridge or a connection from the physical to the spiritual world. He is able, as a result of him being partially spiritual, to tap onto the spiritual powers that exist. And the Zat Hashem next week will talk about how one can tap into those spiritual powers that exist. So in the same way one can tap onto the good powers that exist, one can tap onto the negative powers that exist. I mean, either you go right or you go left. But it is possible for the human being, Hashem made it so that he should be able to connect. And prayer is one of the ways that he connects to the spiritual world. Not only does he connect, he can actually affect that which is in the spiritual world. Now, if we say that man can affect, what we mean that he can have a positive effect or a negative effect. He can do good things and he can do terrible things. For example, we all know that through one's hands one can do physical damage. We know that through speech one can do a lot of damage. La shonara, slandering someone. But what about cursing him? Does a curse have an effect? A curse happens in the spiritual realm, not in the physical realm. So he said a few words. How did that have an effect on this individual? He cursed it. That's all he did. Slandering, giving somebody a bad reputation, that we can understand, we can relate to that. Man can also hurt someone through his thoughts. And that works through something called Ainara, the evil eye. How one thinks, how one looks at someone, somehow there is a negative energy that some people have, not all of them, that can do a lot of harm to someone else when they look at them and think of them in a certain negative way. But again, we're not going to review what I've already spoken about years ago. For those who want to know more about Ainara and how it works and how to defend yourself from it, there's a lecture about the evil eye. But these are forms of damage or harm that one can cause another in the spiritual realm. It's not physical at all. He didn't touch him. All he did was say a curse. All he did was look at him in a certain way. Speech is powerful. We know that speech is powerful because we see the consequences, the good consequences of encouragement. We see the negative consequences of an insult. And it was in the physical world we see the power of speech. But that unique power that the human being has called speech is very, very special. But it could be easily misused, unfortunately, in a negative way. Somehow, somehow, using the speech can be very destructive in the form of a curse. And I'm going to elaborate just a little bit more on that in a moment. <clears throat> Why should it work? Why should a curse have any effect? Why should a curse harm someone? Or why should an evil eye do anything? Just because he stared at him in a certain way? Why? <clears throat> All of us are, are familiar with the breakdown or the decay 
of uh, physical matter. That which is physical, that which is chemical, can easily fall apart, can decay. It's called wear and tear. There's many, many ways for that which is physical to just fall apart. What most people don't realize is that even that which is spiritual within us can become weak. Now, think about the ozone. Are you familiar with about the ozone? They've been speaking a lot about the ozone layer in the atmosphere, how it protects us from hazardous radiation, ultraviolet rays from the sun. And if there's a hole in that ozone layer, it could be very harmful to life in this planet. It is possible sometimes for an individual to have his protective coat, let's call it, or layer of spirituality perforated, weakened. It can happen in all kinds of ways. And once that spiritual layer becomes weakened, things get through. Just like allergies, sometimes the human being cannot fight it off. His immune system has become weak and he easily becomes sick. The human being can become spiritually sick. He can become very weakened. And then it's very difficult to deal with all kinds of forces out there in the spiritual world that can invade and cause them all kinds of harm. What witchcraft and the evil eye do is they attempt, they don't always succeed, they attempt to weaken the pipeline between the human being and his source. We, there's a certain pipeline from which the source of the, where the soul comes from receives its nourishment. Think of it as an, um, an umbilical cord. The baby has an umbilical cord through which it receives nourishment. The soul continues in this world somehow connected to his source. We don't see it, that connection, but it exists. A little bit like a puppet, there's strings. If you sever that string, you sever that connection, or you clog it, then all that nourishment, all that shefa, all that abundance, all that blessing that is coming down and keeping this man or woman alive can become, uh, I guess you can say, weakened or damaged. Witchcraft, the evil eye, are dangerous because they can do that. They can sever that connection temporarily. They can cause tremendous harm. They can clog the pipeline. You know what a clogged pipeline is. I mean, you've had plumbing problems. The water doesn't go through or doesn't get in. So you suffer. So in the spiritual world, people can suffer. Their mazal, their destiny, all of a sudden is on hold. Things don't work out for them. Something is wrong. Now, there could be many explanations why so sometimes people see everything falling apart around them. There's all kinds of explanations for it, but sometimes it is possible that there was some curse, that there was some evil eye, or some witchcraft done to an individual. Because of that, they're going through a very, very hard time. But how did it do it? It can only succeed if the spiritual curtain or layer, spiritual coat, that every human being has is weak to begin with. Then it comes and does what it does to hurt the individual even more. So when, when the spiritual coat of the human being is weak, all kinds of mazikim, all kinds of destructive forces can penetrate and do harm. One of the things that the Kabbalah teaches is that one should be very careful from Kitrugim. Kitrugim are accusations. There are times when a person commits a wrong, an offense, an avon, a sin. And if it's a serious offense, what that does automatically is it brings about a Kitrug on him. Kitrug meaning an accusation. That sin is an informer. It goes to the heavenly court and says, he did this. 
Now, usually, we don't have to worry about these things immediately because we're only judged once a year. Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment. We're judged also after we leave this world. But the Kabbalah teaches that there's a mini judgment every night before we go to sleep for what we did during that day. And the outcome of that judgment can affect our lives the next day. Perhaps not as much as the outcome of our judgment on Rosh Hashanah, but something can happen, depending what it was, the following day. That is why in Judaism there's an emphasis on reading the Shema before you go to bed. And saying words of confession, of vidui, forgiving those who may have wronged you, asking forgiveness from those who have wronged, who you may have wronged. Before we go to sleep, we want to make sure we sleep well, we have good dreams, and that our, our luck does not change for the worse the next day. So, Kriyat Shema is a powerful prayer before one goes to sleep. But why is it so necessary? Simply because that's the fact. The fact is that when one commits a wrong, he has an accusation against him. He has a blemish on his record. Imagine a misdemeanor. Okay, it's only a misdemeanor, it's not a felony. But it's going to be on the record for a number of years until it comes off. That's what I'm told. You don't want anything on your record. You want good credit if you're applying for a job or for a loan. So anything that can ruin your credit, you don't want. So you try to deal with it as soon as possible. So the Kabbalah teaches, be careful with accusations because if those accusations are even a little bit effective, it could lead to trouble. It could lead to an individual being exposed to all of these dangerous forces out there that all they need is an excuse to attack, to cause harm. Many of you perhaps remember the famous uh, speech that Eliyahu Navi, Eliyahu the prophet, told the Jews that he was trying to convince to abandon idolatry. Until when will you continue to hop between the two ideas? God in idolatry. You can't have both. Either God is the true God or idolatry. Choose one. But they were trying to lead a double life. You can't do that. You have to decide. A lot of people mm -hmm. want to have a spiritual life, but they want to commit all kinds of wrongs, all kinds of offenses. The big question therefore will always be, who is your boss? Who is your boss? Is it God? Or is it idolatry? Or is it the impure forces? That should be the question one should always ask him. That's the ultimate question. Who is your boss? Who are you working for? And there are some, as the saying goes, who have sold their soul to the Satan. Have you heard of that expression? They sold their soul to the Satan? Yes, because if you want to be a good customer of the Satan, of the impure forces, you basically have to sell yourself. To become a witch, you know, there's a resume that you have to fill out, <laughs> an application, and basically you have to engage in all kinds of impure activities to prove yourself that you are a, a loyal customer. That's called selling your soul to the Satan. So those individuals who were immersed in impurity, they definitely dealt with witchcraft and all kinds of powers out there that exist, all kinds of forms of impure impurity, and they cause harm to themselves too, they didn't realize that, but this causes harm to one too. And I'm not talking about the harm in the afterlife, I'm talking about in this world. But they chose that, they preferred that, it was easier for them as we said before. Unfortunately, I, re I really feel bad for a lot of people who, especially during the period in history where there was a very powerful inclination towards idolatry, they were pulled, even though they believed in God. It was tempting. They fell for it. But it's, it's not real. Yeah. yeah, but it's attractive. And there's a lot of things that people know can cause them a lot of harm, whether it's food or smoking, and they still do it. 
you're addicted to it. It's very difficult to let go. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. You first have to acknowledge that it's wrong, that it's dangerous, and then hopefully get help in dealing with it. And when a person is affected by witchcraft, not that he does it, but he was bewitched, somebody did it to him, whether it's an evil eye or a witchcraft, there are ways to cancel it and get rid of it, but we don't have the time to get into that right now. Tahirin. What is that? Reading Tahirin. I'm going to speak a little bit about that, but that's not always enough. There are some very powerful, powerful uh, forms of witchcraft that you need professional help to get rid of it. Very, very difficult to get rid of. It's not so easy. But there is a way to get rid of it. Why? Why should it be possible to get rid of it? Because what did we say before? A sheker en lo That which is false has no feet to stand on. It's not permanent. It could be canceled. It's not real. If it's not real, you can cancel it out. Somehow, if you know how, you can remove it. Some people claim that it is possible to see the spiritual forces. There, is, there are opinions like that that you can actually see with your physical eyes some of those spiritual forces. It is possible at times, maybe, I'm not sure 100%, to be able to see what they call the aura that surrounds the human being. Even though the aura cannot be seen with our physical eyes, it has been photographed with something called Karelian photography. It's a fascinating field. You can see the various shades or colors around the individual was being photographed and the colors represent something else each color represents something else and they say those who have done some research on this that it could show the status the spiritual status of the individual as well as his physical well-being you can tell in other words a lot about what is going on in this individual how spiritual he is how physical he is and how perhaps how he feels. Maybe. I haven't personally done too much research into this area, so I cannot tell you for sure what all of this means. But it is possible at times to see certain things in the spiritual realm. And perhaps some of you may have noticed at times you're sitting. What was that that just went by? Something just went by, and you saw it from the side. You I just caught a glimpse of it. And this has happened more than once. Yes, it's something spiritual. It could be a ghost. It could be a demon. It could be those forces out there that you cannot usually see with your physical eyes, but at times you're able to see a little bit of it. And if you read up, or if you're you see the video on UFOs, when I talk about UFOs, I explain this a little bit more, what, the, what they are exactly, what people saw. I'm talking about those that are legitimate uh, witnesses. In other words, th that they testified that they saw something. What did they see? I mean, all of these impure forces can be seen with the physical eyes? At times, yes. So there are, there are sometimes situations where we can see that which is spiritual, but for the most part we, we do not see them. But we can experience their effects, like with the evil eye and with the witchcraft. Nonetheless, with the aura, it could be. It's a fascinating area that as a result of the technology that we have today, we may be able to see the difference between someone who is more spiritual or one who is less spiritual. There are many, many illnesses, many illnesses that are more related to the spirit than to the physical body, that we call in Hebrew, mahalot nefesh He's suffering from some ailment that sometimes it's difficult to diagnose because it's not physical. What's bothering him? What pains him? It could be spiritual in nature. And therefore, the treatment for someone like that will be spiritual, not physical necessarily. 
somebody is depressed, and you can give him Prozac, you can give him all kinds of things to temporarily calm him down or restore the chemical balance in him if he has that kind of a problem. But that is not a permanent cure, depending what the source of his problem is. If it's spiritual in nature, then perhaps he needs spiritual treatment. Spiritual therapy can do wonders for people who are suffering from that which is spiritual. It is possible to treat them. What I'd like to finish with is a very important area that is related to this topic, and that is, okay, we know that all of these negative forces exist. What do we do about them? How can we defend ourselves from them? How do we protect ourselves from all of these forces out there? Well, it's important to strengthen the spiritual in us. That is very important. As we said before, if that which is spiritual in us is weak, then they can enter. They can penetrate. So obviously we need to strengthen that which is spiritual in us. How do we do that? The Kabbalah teaches that a Jew should always strive to be a Merkava la Shechina. Merkava la Shechina means to be a chariot or a carrier to the Shechina, to the Divine Presence. It means that through his deeds, through his behavior, he should draw the Shechina, the Divine Presence, into his home. As one rabbi once asked his students, can anyone in this room tell me where God is? And they all said, what do you mean, where God is? God is everywhere. He says, no, you have it wrong. God is wherever you let him in. There are some people who don't invite God into their homes. So you want to be a Merkavala Shechina, you want to be a spiritual person, you have to invite him in, not drive him out. And guess what happens when you invite the Shechina into the house? You are driving out the Sitra Ahara, you are driving out the other forces. Because they would love to be in your home. Right? They would love to occupy that place, that spot. <clears throat> but they are not going to if you invite the Shekhinah. The two are not going to coexist in the same place. So if you want to be, become a more spiritual individual and have less trouble dealing with these forces out there, drive them out by being a Merkava Shekhinah, by inviting the Shekhinah into the house, by making the house a holier place. Protecting oneself is not easy. But we see in the military that they do all kinds of things to protect themselves. They have bulletproof vests, they have missiles against missiles, right? They have all kinds of body armor against explosives. The military does all kinds of things in order to protect themselves from that which is a physical danger. We also have a system to protect ourselves from the spiritual forces out there, the negative spiritual forces. What are they? Well, one of those forces that you may have heard, and maybe perhaps are not very familiar with it, is called Kemia. There are certain amulets that are very powerful and act as protectors, a shemira, for the individual, for the home, for a woman giving birth because she's in danger. There are situations where a kemia was recommended in the past. The reason why you don't hear too much about it today, depending on which circle you live, is because we don't know which kemia is effective. Which one will do the job? Was it written properly? Many of them have mistakes. They contain holy names, these amulets. And if they were written properly by a person who is righteous, who is clean, pure, and he did it in the proper manner, then he could help. Similarly, all of you are familiar with the mezuzah. A mezuzah on our doorpost is not just a mitzvah, a commandment in the Torah. It actually serves as a, a kemiah of sorts to protect those who are dwelling in the house from all kinds of negative forces out there, all kinds. And there are many, many stories how that was able to protect the home because of the mezuzah. So that's important 
to make sure that the mezuzot are kosher mezuzot. What else? Merits, tzchuyot, as we were talking about before, being protected spiritually by a layer of spirituality around us. What is this layer of spirituality? It's the merits that we, that we have as a result of performing good deeds. If a person is charitable, right? he's kind, sensitive, helps others, does good deeds, he acquires a merit. Remember we spoke about an offense before, how that brings about an accusation? Well, the opposite of that, a merit to his name, to his credit, can be very special and helpful in time of need. He has this merit. Offer him protection. So the more merits a person has, the more difficult it is for those impure forces who are so eager to go in, to invade this home or this individual, it makes it more difficult for them to come in. They're, un they're not invited. And, and even if they try hard, they won't be able to get through. This individual is protected. He has merits. Or what you were saying is also true. Prayer, the Helim. For, for an individual to continuously pray, but with Kavanah, with the real intent, where he elevates himself in such a manner that he connects with God, and he's not distracted from that, he's focused on that, he prays fervently. This is powerful stuff. This is not just words that are being thrown about. What do we say before about words, about the power of speech? It's powerful. Shem gave us that ability to affect the spiritual world. Not only to connect to it, but to actually affect it. In a positive way or in a negative way. So, people can cause a lot of harm in the spiritual realm, but they can also do a lot of good for others and for themselves. Not only through the power of speech. We say there are various ways that a person can, can achieve a lot in the spiritual realm. One of them is through good deeds by being a better person, a holier individual. Then there's Torah. <coughs> Rabbis tell us Torah is very powerful in various ways. It protects and it saves us from the evil inclination too. And it enables one to grow, to mature spiritually, to elevate into great heights. So the study of Torah is very powerful. A Jew without Torah is missing out. He's just going to remain the same person that he was always. And you know, what? when you don't progress, you regress. You don't, exactly, you don't stay exactly the same. One always has to strive to become better, <coughs> to progress, otherwise he will regress. The Torah enables one to progress to great spiritual heights. What do we do with one who has a problem with Kishuf or Hainara? As I said earlier, there are ways to cancel it. We don't have the time to go into it right now. One should never give up hope. Even though he may be affected by it, it is possible to eliminate. All I want to add is that many people think as soon as they have a problem, oh, it must be somebody gave me an evil eye. It must be Kishuf. It must be yeah. witchcraft. You know, there are certain cultures who are very superstitious about that. That's not the first thing to blame. There's a lot of other things that it could be before you blame witchcraft or an evil eye. So if somehow it is discovered that somebody did something like that to you, just remember, it is possible to remove. And one way of dealing with this is by becoming a more spiritual individual. I'd like to finish with a saying that I heard. I don't know who said it. The saying goes like this. We cannot change the world. But we can change ourselves. And by changing ourselves, we, can, we will change the world. This is similar to what Gandhi said, if you recall. Gandhi says, you be the change that you want to see in the world. The world is full of all kinds of evildoers, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. People who have chosen the evil camp. And it's very, very difficult to change that. That has been the case for years. That evil has been the more powerful force out there, not holiness. But if people do take it upon themselves to change themselves, then that is what it will take to change the world. In other words, it has to start somewhere. The only way to make a change is to change yourself. And how do we change ourselves? 
by being holier, by being kinder to people. This is what it will take. Kedoshim to you, the Torah reminds us, the Jewish people, be holy. Why should we be holy? Because I'm holy, Hashem says. You want to have a relationship with me? You want to be connected to me, with me? Then be like me. I'm giving. Be giving. Be kind. This is a lesson that humanity has not learned. From the very beginning. Could you imagine what would have happened to this world if there would have been no wars? No pogroms. No inquisition. No persecutions. No thievery and corruption. Just normal people just conducting themselves properly, leading a normal life in an unselfish way, it would have been a beautiful world. It would have been a holier, a holier place. And <laughs> we would have had a very, very different kind of, an, of experience. Look at the world. Read any history book. Look what has happened. Man has chosen to be evil. And evil has different names. And evil has been in every corner of the world. It's not just one particular corner. Everywhere you have evil people. In every religion you have evil people. It's not just one religion. It's not just one country. And it's, just, it's not just one era. Even today. People have chosen that. But they don't have to choose that. If you choose God, if you choose to be kind, to be benevolent, to be good towards others, then you will be protecting yourself from all those evil forces. But if you join hands with them, with the evil, by being like the evil, then obviously you're not only causing all this harm, but you're exposing yourself to more and more evil. If you don't want to be exposed to that, if you want to be protected from that which is evil, then at least make the change in yourself, in your home, in your own marriage, in your own relationship. It is possible to build a relationship with your spouse, with your children, and with God. How? By being a holier individual and by being a kinder individual. Olam chesed ibane. Let's not forget that. That is the way it's built, with kindness. It doesn't say anything else. Because kindness is spiritual. Kindness is unselfish. Kindness is holy. That's the language God speaks not the language of sheker, of falsehood of this world, of everything is about me, selfishness, about destroying, about hurting, about suing somebody in court for what he did to you. You know what road rage is? Road rage is? What's road rage? Anger, selfishness, all this divisiveness, all of these problems. Where does this come from? This is all the evil power, the evil forces out there. And they've been winning. They've had the upper hand. Man has chosen, unfortunately, to go with that camp and not to be holy and kind. But of course, all of that is going to end very soon. Mashiach is coming. Amen. Mashiach is coming very, very soon. And at that point, of course, the glory of Hashem will become known to everybody. Everybody will know the truth. Okay.